Okay, thank you. Actually, I'm in, sitting in my car uh, presenting, so if it audio breaks up, let me know. But this is the right place. I'm at the parking lot of Computer History Museum in, in uh, Mountain View um, to talk about this uh, real challenge in risk five vector processing. Um, we'll start with a little history of my professional career. Um, some of you may remember the great uh, processor war of the 1990s. Basically, this is when the CISC processor really came to light. Um, the PCs were gaining great uh, acceptance and we had big players, right? Intel, AMD, and Motorola, and other uh, x86 processors as well. Value of this uh, CISC processor was it could operate on a register and a memory location. So basically, uh, to make software simpler, it had complex hardware. Then came along RISC processors, basic or, or DSPs. Um, DSPs were specialized processor that did math very well. One thing DSP did was it operated on registers or local memories. So it had a high memory bandwidth. Lastly, RISC processors came along about this time, MIPS being very popular, uh, where I spent uh, about 15 years of my life in MIPS architecture. Basically, RISC processor took CISC processor and decided, well, let's make hardware simpler. And because software, could be compiled and optimized um, to get a higher frequency. So in the 90s, we lived with these three major architectures, CISC, RISC, and DSP. Well, something happened, things happened in the 2000s um, where we started chasing gigahertz. Um, some of you remember our original IBM PC was 4.77 megahertz. Today, we have PCs running about five gigahertz. So we, we, we've gone up thousand times in my career. But um, what was happening is if CISC and DSP was getting harder and harder to scale to higher frequency and CISC processor uh, started incorporating MAC, multiply accumulator units in the CPU. And it was a little easier for CPUs to go higher frequency. So in a way, uh, DSP, um, lost the war from frequency, complexity, and also CPU getting more performance. And lastly, hard-coded uh, codecs. Um, and then what happened was CIS processor, because it was complex, it started having problems going high speed. Um, and, and fundamentally, if you think about CIS, there's a CIS instructions, but there were always something called micro-ops, micro-op code, which were risky instructions. So ultimately, even today, um, all the processors are basically risk processors. Um, they even x86 from Intel AMD have a front end that's a sys to risk converter type. I'm very simplifying here. Um, and it's a risk processor. So today, um, the rise of risk, risk is risk. It's a very complex, um, complex systems built around fundamental risk engines. So with this, um, we had in the, the uh, 2000s, we had a big uh, three 2000s, 2010s. ARM became dominant in uh, mobile. MIPS became dominant in a little more TV, set top box, multimedia arena. Um, ultimately, mobile volume swamped MIPS and Risk Five was born. Um, and that's the world we live in today. Um, so let me go to the next slide. Um, so the, the benefit value of the risk that we see, that I see as well, is simplicity. You could have simplest processor, RB32i, RB32e, or RB64i, 64i, basically if it's simplest processor. Well, and then you can open and add extra instructions. Um, some of this might be a previous talk before. Uh, maybe some extensions can go on the FPGA and you have uh, more optimal instructions. Multiplier, almost every processor has, floating point. Um, and then the, the real big extension that we'll all talk about is vector extensions. It's almost final, 1.0 RC. Um, hopefully it's final soon. But as uh, Imperis mentioned, specs have evolved over the last couple of years where 
early customers do have silicon with the previous generations. So here's a traditional architecture. CPU, um, multiple CPUs, and they have private L1 caches, perhaps private L2 caches tied to a common system bus. And we, this gets duplicated as a cluster and, uh, and so on. So compute is relatively easy. There are vector engines for multiple companies. Uh, we certainly have one. And uh, we find that compute is relatively easy piece of the pie. But the problem is easy for us. It, uh, the, it creates issue for customers as they implement the processors. Checking time. Um, so this is our vector engine. <clears throat> um, scalar processor decodes the instructions. Any vector instructions get sent to vector instruction queue. And within my vector engine, there are multiple lanes. Um, multiple lanes means we could do multiple operations. And we could do um, standard uh, instruction formats, multiple instructions, multiple lanes of configurable vector with engines. And all this high compute actually goes through RISC-V vector loads and stores and CPU loads and stores. And what that looks like in the block diagram is this. At the top is representative pipeline for the scalar processor, vector processor engine, sort of acting like an accelerator, um, talking to external custom coprocessor or custom memories. Or if you duplicate multiple times, it's, it's a cluster architecture. Well, there's a choke point. Uh, one point is on the upper right, everything goes to main system bus. See, bus was already busy with the processor. Now it's got vector instructions and vector data. Um, latency gets longer, system performance drops. In some ways, it's good for power management. If your processors are not running 100%, you may not need a big heat sink. However, in the embedded system, you want to optimize power and performance. So here's the, um, what it looks like, a little more differently. The 90s architecture, even early 2000s, uh, there was a CPU or clusters of CPUs. And then you talk to an accelerator, whether it's GPU, DSP, and today it's a neural network block. And then there's a, probably a control CPU somewhere um, in a big system. And I'm again highlighting that common shared bus with limited bandwidth. So how do we increase the bandwidth without increasing additional power and maintain high frequency? Because simple, simple way to put it, is I can make my bus wider and wider and wider to increase the bandwidth. Um, neural network blocks or vector extensions, uh, 512 bit is common. People are talking about thousand bits of neural networks. To feed that, I could have a thousand bit bus, but that's a lot of overhead. So how, how we're doing this, um, most vector processors on the market today are starting to support 512 kilobyte data L1 cache. Um, in my life, I have not designed a processor with greater than 64 kilobyte data cache because of timing. I'm not sure what this will do, um, but there's a challenge. And maybe put larger L2 and L3 caches. Uh, fundamentally, it introduces PPA and uh, fr max frequency issues. Or we could go to DSP approach, where there are caches, there are local memories, and lastly, there's a dedicated memory port that gives you predictable bandwidth, predictable latency, because DSP fundamentally is a real-time processor. Um, and bonus is data isolation or security. Data doesn't go over the main buses. So Andes, what does Andes have to solve this problem? We have something called Andes Custom Extension. We call it ACE. And you could do three things with it. Um, you create new instructions to accelerate performance. You could create attached coprocessors, custom bus to create a coprocessor, and you could create a new dedicated memory location. So ACE, ACE works with C, works with impair simulators, uh, great semantics for new instructions, and it's semi-automatic custom instruction generation. Um, contact me and we'll give you, gladly give you a demo of our copilot tool to generate custom instructions and extensions. So this is a co-pilot. Nice thing is it's a development 
and verification environment um, where you start with the simulator, both the simulator that we have, which is psycho accurate. You, you'll be able to soon be able to use Impair Simulator as well um, to try your new instructions. To do that, you put the little headers into the um, your compiler disassembler. Um, and then you could run it on the simulator, write a short RTL, run it on RTL. And to, because these two things are generated independently, creates automatic cross-checking environment. So it's easy to create. And how we create that is something, a reference that is called streaming port. Basically, we create a custom data port with a custom data memory to external hardware engine, whether that's neural network accelerator or, um, or different maybe video codecs or any codecs. But the uh, neural network accelerator, it seemed to be running well. Data bus could be LMOL aware or VLAN aware. It could be as wide as you need, as fast as you need. Um, ACE pipeline, uh, we create custom instructions to control the external hardware accelerator. So fundamentally, um, we could create a hardware application specific DMA in and memory location, control that uh, control the accelerator. Uh, it's very tightly coupled. So on the high level, we have a and these uh, vector processor, we'll call it NX27B, supports a full vector extension. Early customers um, have taped out with the first generation vector, our vector core at 0.8. Um, there's a second generation intermediate, third generation uh, we're delivering with a 1.0 with the I to final spec. Um, scalar processor is a five stage pipeline single issue scalar. Um, caches, Maximum size was 64 kilobytes. Um, this will be getting bigger uh, for a traditional architecture. Um, obviously, things like prefetching is important, outstanding data accesses. So it's a wide data path to feed the uh, vector engine. And then lastly, we add the string port to even, even create a bigger and secure data path. So what have we extended from a standard vector extension? Well, we put two uh, AI specific data formats, bfloat 16 and N4, um, configurable VLAN SIMD memory configuration. Um, and then we, we fully support vector five, uh, risk five vector loads and stores, and then ACE loads and stores as well. Again, we want to increase the bandwidth. So previous black diagram, we had a choke point at AXI bus for CPU and vectors. We could still communicate um, on the AX, AXI bus loads and stores, but we now have a separate streaming port to talk to custom memory and talk to custom accelerator. Um, like I said, benefit is uh, higher bandwidth, a data movement, dedicated memory, so it's predictable latency, um, and then increase that high performance. And Basically, this is another way to show you how we generate the custom extensions and custom ports and memories. Everything's semi-automatic. Only thing you have to worry about writing in Verilog or C is that small green block called instruction logic. We'll control all the decoding, handshaking, pipelining hazards. You just worry about your specific function. You write it in C or Verilog. Other things that can be done, this is sort of what if architecture. What if two processors or multiple processors are cooperating on same data or streaming data? Um, it would be easy to create a ping pong type of architecture where the processor is working on part of the data in one memory and second memory is being filled and emptied by external DMA. So the uh, architecture beyond the CPU is getting interesting. And that is the problem our customers need to solve how to move data in and out of the core, uh, in and out of the uh, vector engine. So what does it look like once this is all done? Well, you have the single processor tightly coupled to a um, hardware engine, um, perhaps a L2 memory or local memory, and then create that, that creates a processing element. And then you could duplicate that as many times as you need. A um, little more predictable bandwidth, and uh, higher performance. 
Okay, we support programming models like OpenCL or other multi-programming environments. Here's some performance gains. Now this is a CPU only, not using an accelerator, but uh, initially we're seeing about 20 to 60X acceleration in some of the basic functions. And this is what it looks like in mobile net acceleration. In, if you use a standard RISC-V RV64M instruction set, um, mobile net version one, your network model, actually takes 55 billion cycles um, for one, one picture identification. If we use a DSP, RISC-V DSPP extension, actually we get about 10X acceleration. It goes down to about 4 billion cycles. Um, in which five vectors, if we use a vector instruction, if we get further about three X, four X over DSP instructions, um, and we could complete in about 1.3 um, billion cycles. Now, how it translates to this is, depending on, we have FPGA demo running about 50, 60 megahertz. Um, the risk five vector demo completes in about a minute or less. A DSP takes about four minutes and then risk five 64, we have not run to completion. We, we run out of patience at about 20, 25 minute mark. But DSP instructions for vector risk five is powerful. Vector instructions are powerful as well. We have other tools to optimize this uh, pipelines. Um, this is called Clarity. This is standard processor instructions, but also works on vector instructions. Shows you whether the, um, whether the, uh, the loads and stalls are so you could optimize assembly level. Um, for those of you who are really trying to ring out all the uh, performance. Okay, so that is it. That is my position on challenges of vectors. Vector engines are out there now. Now, how do we use it effectively? Um, so any questions? I'll go to chat. Looks like there's some questions. Um, but you could also email me for any demos, um, presentations. Okay, Thea, I think uh, I'm done. All right. Thank you so much, John.